This podcast was recorded on traditional Denizal land. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Before the Peace. I am Trey Lopashinsky. Today we chat with the Executive Director of the Saquon Heritage Society, Alyssa Curry, to get an update on the historic site. I haven't chatted with Alyssa on the podcast since August 2022, so since then a lot of work has gone into the site, including a dome artifact repository, an amphitheater, the interpretive trail. There's so much that they have worked on, that they're working on, that they have planned for the future, and Alyssa gets into it this episode. I also talked to her about the weight of being responsible for a very important piece of history in the region and balancing work with building relationships. Now, initially for this month's episode, since it's being released the day before a National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, I wanted to chat with a couple of leaders in Northeast BC about their thoughts on how reconciliation is doing here in Northeast BC, how it's progressed over the past couple years, as well as talking about the the National Day, the events that have gone on in the region since it was declared. However, I had a couple of cancellations, so what I had hoped to do for that episode and the special episode that I wanted to create compared to last year, where uh, Jenna and I kind of talked about our journeys and how the podcast has been going, and then we also had some clips from people in Fort St. John who had visited the block party telling us what reconciliation meant to them. On my list was also Alyssa, but I was worried about having her on the podcast around the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. I thought people might be upset with me having her on around that important day because she is non-Indigenous. However, I figured that was super silly. The importance of truth and reconciliation is everyone working together. And Alyssa is... I mean, near a perfect example of an indigenous neighbor, ally, supporter, whatever you want to call her. Like, she works directly with Doig River First Nation, Prophet River First Nation, and West Moberly First Nation because they do own Sequa. And she works with the elders in those communities as well as other First Nations communities as well. I think her job is a perfect example of reconciliation as she and the many people that she works with from contractors to the board to these communities that I mentioned to, you know, residents in general is literally working to help make sure the Denizah history is preserved and available for everyone to take in. Before we get into the interview with Alyssa, I did want to mention, like I mention every single podcast, if you have any guest ideas or any ideas for the podcast as a whole, please send them to before the peace at energeticcity.ca or before the peace at musefm.ca. Also, you can reach out to me at before the peace on Instagram and at before the peace underscore on Twitter. Also, this podcast wouldn't be possible without the help of Troyer Ventures. Troyer has been serving our community and the energy industry with tank and vac trucks since 2000. They are built on the principles of hard work, service, and the community, and they are proud to offer the financial support to make this program possible. Thank you so much to Troyer Ventures, and thank you so much to Alyssa Curry. Here she is. Last time I was here in Saqua and speaking with you was last August. Wow. So August 2022. And then when I came to visit you a couple weeks ago, that was the first time I've been back <laughs> in like a year to Saqua. It's been, this year has moved by so quickly, I swear. It has. But um, so much has changed. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. Like the last time I came here, I was huffing and puffing, going to, uh, to look at the cave <laughs> and come back up. Down yeah, to the cave. yeah. As we're having, trying to have a conversation, I'm sitting there. Like, oh. And then last time, a couple weeks ago, when I came to visit you, um, and we went through the trail, and guess what? I was able to breathe fine. <laughs> Let's just talk about all the new things here at Saquon. How long have you guys been closed to the public? I wanted to ask you that, like temporary closed. It's been since the archaeological study last year, right? Yeah, so basically since last summer, we've mm. had um, equipment operating on site and construction happening on site. And so we have been closed for almost 
the better part of a year now um, getting things ready for the public. Um, we're nearly finished this phase of construction. You've heard that from me a lot, <laughs> but um, I'm hoping this time my, my word will ring true that um, we'll be able to welcome the public um, soon to the site and they'll get to see all of the fantastic new improvements like our archaeology dome yeah that we're s literally sitting in right now and i'll get to the dome because yeah the dome you have accessible washrooms you have the interpretive tra trail where you have um what would you call it? interpretive signs that's set up yes. throughout the trail giving you a little bit of the history of the dene saw and then um and you're not trekking up and down a hill so it's accessible there too you got the stage what, what, what's the, the amphitheater. amphitheater is the correct name for it um it's still missing a uh, roof but that's yep. something that you guys you guys are getting built plus there's so much more going on so let's start with what you guys have um you know pretty much finished or in place right now and the dome we're in the dome Yes. Let's speak about the dome. What is the purpose of the dome and what can residents look forward to once Saquon is open and they can come visit the yeah. said dome? <laughs> I just love saying dome apparently. The dome, the dome. <laughs> uh, so the archaeology dome was funded by the First Peoples Cultural Council and it's part of our greater transformation of the site into a artifact repository so that we can repatriate um, archaeological artifacts back to the community. So, um, um, a repository is a term um, provided by the BC Archaeology Branch, and there's certain requirements um, as to the standards that have to be met to hold a repository. Um, but those are, you know, they're a very high set of standards, but they're still the legal minimum. Mm -hmm. And so we are, you know, in an effort to decolonize the repository process and to repatriate these items in a way that is uh, in keeping with the Deneza values, we are creating the dome as what we're calling our living repository. So there will be um, a repository space in our primary building where sensitive artifacts will be held. Um, but the archaeology dome is the place where people will be able to come and see archaeology in action. Um, it meets the requirements for us to be able to have an ongoing archaeology dig. There's a, a space right behind me where we've got a, an open excavation unit. And we want to demystify the process for people of what happens to an artifact between the time that it comes out of the ground, um, which is kind of the, the visible archaeology that people picture. They picture people, you know, with shovels and trowels. And what happens to it before it eventually ends up in a museum and in a display case. Because there's a lot of things that happen to an artifact between those two stages. There's, you know, cataloging, there's description, there's, you know, all of these things. Um, and what the Archaeology Dome is going to show is not only the process of archaeology in progress, but also that living repository where people will be able to see the lifespan of an artifact from the moment it leaves the ground till the day it enters the physical repository that's uh, so interesting so you did mention too um how this process is to pay respect towards the Dene's uh, people how is it different from other archaeo ar archaeological oh man every time i talk to you <laughs> I, it's that one word uh that process how does it differ so typically, um, the archaeological cataloging and processing and eventually curation of artifacts takes place at a museum. It's a de designated repository behind closed doors. Um, it takes a lot of professional experience to be able to um, handle that process. Um, you know, usually an archaeology degree or a museum studies degree. Um, but what we heard from communities when we were doing consultation on building a repository was that the artifacts essentially disappear from view and then, you know, magically reappear many years later. And, and there's not a lot of communication about what happens to those materials. Um, and even myself, I started working here and I didn't really understand what happened to things until we hosted uh, an artifact uh, workshop here for some of our field school students. And so we're really just trying to be fully transparent about that process and take something that usually happens behind closed doors and let the public and our communities see what that process entails through the entire, entire steps. So now I'm mentally moving from the dome to some of the other 
new spaces on site. So one of the most important, the bathrooms. Yes. Um, do, <laughs> you, you joke, but you know, when we did, I our, mean, they're beautiful bathrooms. When we, well, and you know, when we did our accessibility assessment, we had uh, access BC spinal cord injury, BC come out and, mm-hmm. and do some work with us. And they said the two most important accessible infrastructure needs are parking mm-hmm. and outhouses or, or bathrooms generally, mm-hmm. because if you do not have basic access to your site mm-hmm. and you do not have bathrooms, you do not have an accessible site. Which makes so much sense. I mean, yeah, it's bathroom, silly, silly, you <laughs> joke about it. But at the end of the day, yeah, it was a, it was a big ad for you guys. And like even the, the path up to the bathrooms it's like i think it's like light gravel like you guys yeah. so how is it built because it, it looks like it was it, like the path kind of goes it uh, wraps around wraps around oh, yeah you describe it so you go near the bathroom it just seems like the gravel laid down and everything there maybe i'm getting super into the path to the bathroom but there was a lot of work put into it there right was. like you created the, that path and everything so just going off talking about the bathrooms and like the parking lots and um if you want to bring up any funny stories about the parking lot that you told me, I don't know. <laughs> I know you've had some troubles and how to get some big rocks. We've had some big rocks and stuff. You know, I'm very proud of my big rocks. The um, So for um, a, a trail to meet accessible standards, there needs to be some kind of um, crush compact material. Mm. So we're, we're dealing with a, a specialized compact crush that has been um, compacted down uh, with various sands and, and concrete inclusions. Um, and specifically, the trail to the outhouses needs to meet the universal grade, mm. um, which is, I believe it's 3%. Um, and that means, you know, it has to be a gradual enough slope that somebody, for example, with a mobility aid, somebody in a wheelchair, maybe a parent pushing a stroller, you know, universal is, is designed for everyone. Yeah. It's universal. Um, and so we ran into some some challenges when we were installing the outhouse. First off, as a, a known archaeology site, of course, we had to do some archaeological um, work to ensure that, you know, we, we could build the outhouses where we wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. Um uh, our board president, Gary Oker, weighed in with making sure that we were preserving the best Saskatoon bushes on the property. We were able to move the outhouses a little bit to accommodate the, the Saskatoon bushes. Um, and uh, But one of the, the challenges that we ran into while building was that the bedrock is quite shallow here. And due to health and safety regulations, you can't build an outhouse like you used to build an outhouse. You you know dig a dig hole in the ground. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you've got to have an enclosed vault that's fully sealed that can be pumped out. Mm. And so um, the outhouses ended up being quite a bit taller than we expected because we were only able to get so far into the bedrock, which means that we had to kind of supplement the funding that we had received. Northern BC Tourism um, provided funding. The federal um, government provided funding. NDIT provided funding. There was, you know, it, it took a village to, to build <laughs> all of the infrastructure and the outhouses were part of that um, to get to a stage where the outhouses can meet those universal standards. Mm-hmm. And uh, the parking lot as well, the, the funny story that you're referring to is, of course, <laughs> the fact that um, the entrance to our, our interpretive trail is uh, directly adjacent to the parking, and it's done so so that it's easily accessible. Mm-hmm. And what we were finding is that people were pulling up and parking in in the accessible start to the trail and because it is this very specific compact crushed gravel that's been compacted to be accessible for wheelchairs Mm -hmm. when you pull a pickup truck for example onto it that totally disturbs the accessibility and then we were having people with accessibility needs not able to access the trail and so um my brilliant solution to this (laughs) was to to install a a giant rock. Essentially, like we had stuff. We, we bought a boulder, and you know, we, we called our contractor, and they asked, "What size of boulder do we want?" We said it needs to be big enough to like really disrupt somebody that's going to pull a pickup. We want a, like a big deterrent. We need enough space that we can get around if we need to, but it should be very clear that you cannot park here. And so there's three actually now um, beautiful boulders yeah. that uh, that will hopefully get that point across in the future. And, and so far, that 
has alleviated the issue, but it was it was about the fifth time we'd had to recompact that trail that we decided we needed a solution to uh, to make clear to people that that was not one of our parking spaces. I remember when you told me this story a couple weeks ago. You were standing next to the boulder, and the boulder is like half your size. It's like a pretty big. <laughs> it's a big <laughs> it's boulder. A pre- it's a pretty big boulder, and we were talking about how it was cool because, like, you know, elders or people with mobility issues go into the trail, like if they're waiting for the group that they're with or whatever, or that need to take a break they could they can sit on the rocks mm-hmm. like it's it's perfect for anyone sitting on there but now when i like when i drove up this morning for instance i looked at the boulder and i just imagined you next to it and i just started <laughs> giggling because this is so funny when you're making this there's like yeah they were parking on it this gravel is important and you're standing next to this boulder that's half your size and, boulder. and like it's it was just it's a smart decision i mean obviously you guys spent you know so much money and like you said it's it's taken a village to to um create what's been here so far and it will take a village moving forward so now we're past the bathrooms parking lot now moving over to the amphitheater Mm. looks absolutely beautiful so it has like columns um standing up where the roof will obviously sit on and then the background where someone would go and speak is Um, was we've a got sheet fl- of metal. Yeah, and- we've got flagstone mm-hmm. on um, the, the stage, which yeah, is level beautiful. with the ground. And then we have a court and steel um, backing. Court and steel. And yeah. uh, the court and steel um, develops this really beautiful patina on it. So it's kind of a natural rust mm. um, and kind of blends in with the rest of the environment. It's um, kind of reminiscent of an artifact shape. Uh, and then beautiful uh, cedar wood benches that are, um, again, accessible and seating for 60. So the amphitheater was designed um, and built around the, the the need and the demand that we have for large group tours. Um, we have a large group tour showing up just today after oh. this after this podcast <laughs> interview and a couple more uh, later this week. Um, but our our biggest demand in terms of volume of visitors is local schools. And so we wanted to have a place where we could share storytelling, where we could do some drumming, um, where we could have maybe public lectures, where we would have a meeting and a gathering space for those children to come and learn from their elders and have that intergenerational transfer of knowledge. So the the amphitheater is designed to seat 60. Um, That seems like a lot. That's that's two classrooms, Mm -hmm. which is fairly typical for the volume we would get in a given day from a a given school. Um, But, you know, when we were here for National Indigenous People's Day this year, that amphitheater was was full and then some you know yeah i was gonna say there was standing room too wasn't there we had had several hundred people come out that day and so um you know it's great to see that um that structure being put to use and as you mentioned there's going to be some canvas sails that are installed so that we have some shade in the summer and uh it's it's really an opportunity to have a an outdoor gathering space for that cultural sharing that's so important was uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day, was that the first time that the amphitheater was actually like full since being It built? was, yeah. I, um, it's the first time that we had really, you know, put, put a pause on construction mm-hmm. um, and been able to open up the public during construction. And we, we of course, still had things on the go, but yeah. it was an opportunity to fill that space. And uh, it was really great to see. We had some of the kids from the Charlie Lake School come over and join us for the day. And uh, they and, and many other schools have have expressed interest in coming out to the site. And of course, just because of construction concerns, safety concerns, we haven't been able to accommodate them that yet this year, but uh, it was really great to see both the, you know, the kids were sitting on one side. We had some elders um, from the community sitting on the other side. We had members of the community. We had members of the newcomers um, community to Fort St. John. Mm-hmm. We really had, you know, a, a massive cross section of, um, indigenous, non-indigenous, elders, youth, um, everyone kind of coming together for that event was really fantastic. Are you excited? I mean, you you have so much going on that maybe you don't think about it too often, but when this place is fully open, seeing just that on one day when you're in the midst of construction and everyone's like really stoked on what you guys are doing. And I will also bring up, there was a really cool announcement that day as well, but, um, 
are you excited for the the future uh, like when this place is open up and there's classrooms all going around and maybe there's some you know people stopping in to to take a look at the trail like you guys are doing so much right now that maybe it's hard to look ahead yeah. and, th- and think of that but i mean does that sift in your head like i i'm excited and i don't even i like i just come out and hang out with you <laughs> and talk with you basically <laughs> yeah you know that day was really special for me because it was the first opportunity that we had uh, both to have kids out um, after the new trail had been built and have a classroom out to to experience that with us but we also had um, some of our elders come out, including um, one of the elders, Auntie Mary, Mary Mahanache, who was our inspiration for one of the interpretive signs. And so she got to come out and see her words in print on the interpretive sign and see that message, that, that culture, that lesson being shared um, with the community. That was, that was so beautiful. And it is exciting. You know, I... On, on a day-to-day basis, I, as executive director, have a lot of responsibility, and I'm, I'm looking ahead to reporting deadlines and, um, you know, the, the objectives we have to achieve and the deliverables and, and all of these things. And on, on a day-to-day basis, I have a tendency to look at all the work we still have left to do. Mm, what's in front of um, you, yeah. Yeah, and so it was really exciting on that day to take a moment to pause and to reflect on what we have done so far and to be grateful for the work that's been done so far and to get that feedback from the community that we're on the right track. That was so incredibly rewarding. And uh, yeah, it, it makes me really excited for what's to come. And, and I know the community is excited too. I am a woman of many post-it notes. I, I organize <laughs> myself by post-it notes and I have probably 20 post-it notes on my desk right now so with I. requests from, from schools, from um, nonprofit organizations, oh from educational institutions. These that are all organizations here. that, you know, we've said as soon as we, as soon as we kind of wrap things up and we can facilitate tours, then, you know, you guys are on my call and they're, there's so much interest and demand, and that is that's exciting to have the community excited with us is really great. Yeah, I'm just, I mean, it's nice to hear that other people are telling you how great it is because every time I get come here, I, I feel like I get so excited. Like I'm 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 excited. I'm lucky to be able to come and get you know a behind the scenes you know tour of what you guys are doing, um, and it's just absolutely wonderful, Alyssa. Um, I just wanted to go before we keep going and, and get onto the trail. I did want to talk about uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day. There was a huge announcement. Oventive donated a large amount of money to say qual- How much was it exactly? It yeah. was Oventive donated four hundred thousand oh dollars over three years. It's oh, a, yeah, a commitment a from Oventive. It's a, a incredibly generous contribution. It is the largest corporate donation that we have received to date by a long shot. That is huge. So, first of all, what's the relationship like with Saquon and Oventive? Like, how did that end up happening? Is there any? And did they just? surprise you guys like how (laughs) was there any relationship there like I'm very curious yeah so um we had approached Oventive and a number of other corporate sponsors um the first summer I worked here so uh two summers ago Mm. we had approached Oventive about supporting a training program we were doing and they were thrilled to support um this training program they offered us uh, you know a, a donation to support that that program and which was a artifact curation training program for indigenous community members and uh, after that program, we, of course, we, we shared what a successful program it had been. And the next time Oventive was in town with some of their executive members, they asked if they could come out and see the site. And, of course, we were happy to, to share that with them. And uh, over the last two years, Oventive has supported uh, a number of initiatives that we've had, on, you know, all on a, a much smaller scale than this, obviously. Um, very generous contributions, but towards, you know, specific programs, mm-hmm. um, specific objectives. And so um, 
we really have to, to, to shout out to, you know, their Indigenous Relations team, Tyson, um, and their entire executive staff for, you know, making the time to come out to see why this site is important, why it's significant to the community, um, and what we're trying to do here. And it was, you know, after several of those those visits and after them supporting us several times on a, on a, on a much smaller scale that they said, you know, we feel this is really important and we feel that you have made incredible progress with the funding that we have provided to you that this is you know we're able to see the results mm -hmm. of that contribution back into the community and see that it's directly benefiting um, the development of the community and so yeah they they approached us and said we want to make you know a, a larger contribution and we want to <laughs> we, yeah, we want to kind of have a conversation about what that looks like and so um, part of the conversation that we were having with Oventiv was around matching funds for grants. Um, we can access as a, a charitable organization, a nonprofit organization, uh, we can access various, you know, federal and provincial funds. There's a few local grants. Um, Northern Development Initiative Trust has, you know, granting opportunities for us. Uh, First Peoples Cultural Council provides granting opportunities for us. But many of these grants, particularly government grants, require matching funds. So they require you to provide 50% of the funding and support for a particular project or mm -hmm. a particular fund. And that can be really challenging. It's difficult to say you can't afford to apply for a grant, but you really can't in some cases if you don't have the other 50% of the project already allocated you can't apply for the grant. You can't mm -hmm. make use of it. And so um, part of our conversation with Oventive was that um, a commitment to a contribution allows us to utilize and essentially double that contribution by applying to grants. And mm -hmm. so what was especially important and significant about this was not only the the dollar value, which was incredible, was exceptional, but was also that commitment that that was, you know, something that would be delivered over three years mm -hmm. that we then can use to apply for additional funding. And so, um, you know, what we said was, you know, we don't, not that we don't need all the money right away. I mean, there's always things that we can, can support on, but knowing that that funding is coming allows us to start making plans and to show our funders with confidence that other people are getting behind this project. And I feel like spreading it over multiple years kind of helps out plan for the future, right? Absolutely. Because like you said, there's a lot of things going on, but you might you probably have a list of priorities on Absolutely. where you want to lean with things. So this just makes it, I guess, essentially it gives you less stress when you're applying for funding and, and things like that. And it's so interesting. I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but now you're talking about it. Um, you know, a lot of people might not know for nonprofits, the difficulties with grants, like, and, and filling out, it's a, it's a big it, process. It's a massive process, both applying for the grants, the reporting that's required for grants. And of course we, you know, we fully support that. It's all about financial transparency and ensuring mm -hmm. that, um, that every organization that receives taxpayer dollars is being accountable for those funding, but it does put a, a huge burden on nonprofits. And the other challenge that many nonprofits have, dare I say all nonprofits have, is capacity. Mm -hmm. So here at Saqua, um, there's one permanent full time staff. Mm -hmm. It is me. Every other position that we have is on a contract term. It's on usually a temporary term or a, a part time temporary term. And so that um, capacity challenges means that we want to we want to ensure that we're able to deliver on mm. on you know the promises that we make to funders that's something we hold very dear to us is that we're going to be responsible with the the gifts that have been provided to us and that we are going to you know return that investment back into our community and make sure that everyone who visits this site can benefit from those beautiful contributions those beautiful gifts that have been given to us yeah and and i mean part of that responsibility to 
you know, organizations and, you know, people who are donating is, you know, you got to fill out these <laughs> grant forms properly. Like it's, it's a, it's a stressful thing from what I've heard. I've never had it to fill is. one out, but I've heard actually that's a lie. I totally have at work, but I've heard for some businesses and nonprofits, it's, it's a, it's a huge process and they're not just filling out one grants. And then there are other organizations that then have to, you know, or don't have to, but reach out to like the city for, yeah support a letter of support yeah. for the grant to you know help them move forward in that process to potentially get it yeah. and then like it's such a difficult process that even the prd i believe the city does as well have grant writers yes on staff whose whole to, job yes. is to facilitate that and to report on it absolutely some of our larger grants they they take weeks mm -hmm. of, of work gathering um supporting documentation to port, um getting you know the additional other funding in place getting you know the, this is a huge amount of work and then afterwards to ensure that um you know we, that we've met all the deliverables we're approaching uh, a deadline actually just this week um for a pretty substantial grant um, funded by the ccrf the canadian cultural revitalization fund um that making sure that we have met all of the deliverables that we committed to at the start of the project and that we have um you know, uh, properly accounted for all the GST and all of, you know, mm -hmm. all of these things. There's a lot of different factors that, that go into something like that. But, you know, the end result is that we get to celebrate these successes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this week we have the Minister of Pacifican who Ooh. facilitates that funding is going to be paying us a visit and getting to see what we've accomplished with that funding. And so those opportunities are really great to be able to take a, a pause and to, um, you know, congratulate our community. This is their vision and it's 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 their language and their culture. And I just feel so lucky that I get to be the facilitator of that. It's really it's it's a, a fantastic group effort and uh it's great to to take that pause to reflect on that effort. It's gonna be so much sweeter when everything is done. Like I'm just I need to be here with the first day that you kind of open it to the public and see, you know, kind of what you guys do when you get to that point, if you have like a grand reopening yes. or whatever you want to do. And just the amount of people here, I'm just, I just want to see all the faces and yours especially <laughs> and the huge smile on yours and all the community members that have helped out and, you know, Doig River First Nations and the other First Nations that own the site as well. Mm -hmm. Like just to see all the stakeholders happy in the community, it's just going to be an all around um, very yeah. I, I think sweet day. It's gonna. It's it gonna will be. be. Awesome. And you know, um, you know, Doig River, Prophet River, mm -hmm. West Moberly, all of these communities have such incredibly valuable knowledge holders and elders and language keepers and song keepers, and so it's it's their vision that we're bringing to light, and that's that's what I find really exciting that. You know, I get to act as that conduit to to make these things happen. The the boots on the ground, the person who can get stuff done. It, it's so cool that I'm talking to you now today too. You know, with you know the Saturday being National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, which I do want to talk about in a little bit. But it's cool that this week, you know, the minister is coming down. Uh, you get to kind of like you said, take that pause and then reflect on the work that's been done and and kind of hear the feedback from him and I'm assuming his staff as well. It's just kind of a, a good week. Are you guys doing anything for National Day of Truth and Reconciliation? Or are you going to be at the the Treaty Eight event in Taylor? We are going to be at the the tea dance and the tea dance and, and round dance, dance in yeah. Taylor. Yes, um, we are. You know, wanting to to celebrate and and encourage that that event. Of course, um, acknowledge that event. I should say, and. You know, there's this fabulous event happening in Taylor. It, we hope that everyone's going to come to it. Mm -hmm. um, we will be there distributing um, some books that we were provided. They're pocket copies of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, oh, nice. as well as the TRC Calls to Action, Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. Mm -hmm. um, both of those books were provided uh, by a grant from the Law Matters Society in BC, and they allowed us to purchase those books to give them away. Just give them away. Oh, so that's so cool. So we will have a table at that event and we will be sharing um of course this this week in particular um it's not only uh, reconciliation week but as a nonprofit, there is you know deadlines and, and yeah, other things yeah. and so wanting to make sure that we are are acknowledging that day 
while also honoring our our prior commitments mm-hmm. to funders, we're making sure that uh, we'll be there and supporting Treaty Eight at that event. And they've put an incredible amount of of time and work and effort to facilitate that great event. So we're so honored that they would let us join in and and be a part of that. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting event for sure. I'm I'm super excited to go. I I didn't get to go to the Taylor Powwow this year or last year, mm. so. I'm I'm making sure I'm going to the round dance because I just wasn't able to make it. Um, so let's get back to what's happened at Saquon now. Moving to the main, if not one of the main pieces of Saqua is the new interpretive trail. So kind of mm-hmm. walk us through, um, pun not intended, of like <laughs> what <laughs> residents could experience wh- when they come and visit the trail and. While they're walking it, what are the signs that they're going to see um, as they make their way to the cave? Yeah, so I, I actually want to back up just a little yeah, to, to share what the experience going down to the trail used to be. So for those that hadn't <laughs> visited the trail previously, um, Trey can attest to this. You need cardio. Um, <laughs> you needed your cardio. This was um, an incredibly uh, rustic um experience down to the trail you were uh following um an old indigenous trail down to the cave um that is is part of an extended trail network that spreads across the entire territory but it definitely was not um the level of visitor friendly that we would hope Um, many people parked at the bottom of the property and kind of scaled up the hillside Mm -hmm. um, which was very unsafe and and you know we there was a lot of things that um, obstacles both you know physical and, and otherwise that were preventing people from being able to visit the cave and so the new interpretive trail is a, a low mobility trail, which again is um, on the spectrum of accessibility. It's not quite universal, but it does. Um, it's a vast improvement on what was available previously, and uh, it starts at the top of the property where there is, of course, parking and and bathrooms and all of these other uh, facilities available to people. And through the trail, as you walk down, uh, you walk down through Quaza Watsaze, which is the old old camp. It's our kind of on the land teaching experience where people can come and, you know, see us tanning a moose hide, for example, um, and goes down to the trail. And on that trail, there are five interpretive panels. And each panel was inspired by a different elder's teachings and what we had heard from each of the communities in Doig and Prophet River and, and West Moberly First Nations. Uh, incorporating both the cultural components the the cultural con- the cultural context of the the site and the cave and the landscape as a whole as well as the archaeology so when Saqua was recognized as a national historic site it was really quite uh, special amongst national historic sites in that it was recognized jointly for its archaeological and cultural significance, that on both of these fronts, this is an exceptionally special site. So each of the interpretive signs um, does showcase an artifact that was uh, discovered at Saqua in front of the cave, but it showcases those artifacts through the lens of uh, the Dene's uh, teachings and that language and that culture, and allows you to kind of walk the trail of their ancestors um, with the community telling their own story. And we worked with um, a very talented illustrator. She worked directly with the elders um, and the stories that we had recorded and what they felt was important to be shared to make sure that those were depicted on the signs. We worked with a design team to have each Uh, panel showcase you know a different aspect of nature we've got the fish creek um, that is is cut in the shape of fish and we've got uh, the the tommy attache that everything is alive cut from in the shapes of the trees the surrounding the landscape and so that interpretive trail gives our visitors the opportunity to walk down the trail and and receive a self-guided experience that's super important of course as we discussed with capacity Mm -hmm. being a challenge for our organization and many others Um, but more importantly 
they're getting the opportunity to hear directly from the elders and the community members through those signs. Um, and, you know, when they eventually get to the cave, they have that cultural context that we hope will, you know, educate people on the importance of the site. It will, in turn, hopefully um, work towards reconciliation. Um, hopefully it will reduce some of the graffiti that we have at the site. It will certainly make it more accessible to more community members. And when I say accessible, I mean both physically accessible. As you mentioned, it's a lot easier to get down to the cave now. We've had multiple um, people in wheelchairs able to get all the way down to the site. It's technically not um, to the standard of what would con be considered wheelchair accessible, but that said, you know, everyone's abilities are, are different. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've had people with um, physical mobility challenges able to access the cave that weren't previously. But it's also about cultural accessibility and about sharing the stories that can be shared with the public at large and giving, um, giving our, our non-Indigenous community members an opportunity to, to get a glimpse into that community and into that culture and giving our Deneza community members an outlet to share that with other mm -hmm. people. So... It's, uh, it's an incredible improvement, and it's something that we're very excited about, um, you know, making sure that that trail was built both, you know, to accessible standards, to geotechnical standards, to archaeological standards. There's a lot of logistics that go into something like that, but the end result is absolutely stunning, and... Uh, it's something that certainly I'm very proud of and proud to have been a part of. Yeah, when I was walking down the trail, I I loved it. I loved David. It's beautiful. Definitely, um, anyone who, when you're able to come and visit the trail, you you got to give it a chance. It's it's absolutely beautiful. Even if you've seen the cave before, um, it's it's just a wonderful experience. I would say, you know, and I think most people will say it, especially yourself. Huge change here at Saqua since you came on and, you know, really took a focus in, you know, accessibility and making sure that, like you said, everything was available for, you know, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people of the community to come down and learn or reflect. And there's just so much to do here. And I'm sure there's going to be more in the future. So now, is is the trail pretty much done? Is there anything else you need to do around the cave or the trail so, system? So um, the trail as it exists right now takes a path from the amphitheater through Kwasawatsaze down to the cave. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we would like to extend the trail to make a full circle route okay. um right now you you kind of you go down and then you turn around and you go back up the trail or there's a, a, a shortcut that people can take um if, if, you got the cardio. if, if they've got the cardio <laughs> strength they there is a shortcut um but eventually we would love to put in additional signage mm -hmm. additional trail length um especially um being able to complete the route as a circle is very important to us. Um, and those are things that we can look ahead to in the future and something that we're excited to expand on. But uh, for now, having that space is a, a vast improvement on what was available. So you're talking this week, you're breaching some deadlines. What work is being done um, on the land this week? Or if you can speak about it, like what's, what work are you doing right now this week? Um, yeah, so this week we are finishing up a few of the projects that were funded by the um, Canadian Cultural Rev Revitalization Fund, which is a federal grant. Um, that grant was matched by funding from Northern Development Initiative Trust. And so um, we're kind of, we're, we're crossing the, the final finish line, things like um, getting the canvas sails installed up on the amphitheater, um, making some adjustments to the bathrooms to make sure, for example, example uh, that the the door weight meets the accessible standard that it's not too heavy to open the door um, that the accessible hooks have been installed at the correct heights um, there's also some changes happening inside the building making sure that um, all of our windows um, on the upper half of the building meet uh, energy standards and that um, hopefully it will be a lot more comfortable for the staff uh, myself included this winter uh, <laughs> the the window in my office for example, 
uh, was a, a single pane window and, and quite chilly in the winter time. So <laughs> I'm personally looking forward to having that uh, those windows put in in the main building. But primarily the work that we're doing this week is focused on the exterior of the site and just kind of getting things across the finish line, putting in the last little bits of, of accessible parking signage and those types of things. And then, of course, um, getting all of the documentation that we need in place, both financial documentation, um, photos documenting the process so that they can see what, mm -hmm. you know, what their, their funding has supported, um, making sure that all of our invoices are, are in place. There's a lot of um, technical requirements um, and documentation requirements that are necessary. And I, I use the term, you know, necessary because they are. It's about providing that financial accountability to our funders and in turn the taxpayers that are supporting this project. Moving so from from um, right now till I mean I'm sure you have kind of in your head when you guys do want to open how much work needs to be done I guess until you guys can open up. We're actually we're closer than you'd think. Okay. Um, we're hoping to just coincide with um with kind of the, the spring and being able to have people out to the site without there being snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a bit of work that will need to be done um, later this fall and then first thing in the spring. But um, nearly everything is complete. Once our, our canvas sales are up for the amphitheater, the outdoor experience will be available to people. Um, now we do have some considerations for our primary building. We'll be doing a building feasibility study this winter to talk about the future of that building. But um, the outdoor experience and the archaeology dome are all very close to being finished. And we're hoping that in the spring we'll be able to have that kickoff event and be able to welcome people to the site. Um, welcome people back to the site. Yeah. I think it, it'll be really incredible, especially for those that that have been before, because I think they're going to see the incredible changes that have taken place and uh, be really inspired by them. Yeah, and like I'm pretty sure I'd already said this within the 40 minutes we've been talking but i have been lucky to kind of see the process i mean we started talking when you first started as mm -hmm. executive director and to see it it was you know the house and then you can just walk down to the cave originally as we mm -hmm. spoke going down the hill where i would gas myself out <laughs> the dome wasn't here it was pretty it was just grass yeah um in, in front of the house and to see it change over the past two summers is is fascinating to me because yeah it was just land then last year i saw the digging happening and now there's the trail and the dome and the, the, even the bathrooms <laughs> like it's just the, everything every addition is really cool and uh, again i'm really s stoked for people to to come and see it um I want to move over to National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. So for this month's episode, I have uh, generally what I do every month is I have like a list of guests. And of course, you're on it, Alyssa. I actually have been for a couple of months because I haven't talked to you since August of last year. And, um, you know, things just couldn't work out with other guests this month. And, uh, you know, mainly because, you know, there's been a lot of loss in the community. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, since March, it's been, it's been pretty bad. Um, and, you know, people are busy doing other stuff, you know, with the pauses because of the deaths. And then, you know, unfortunately, people still have work to do and, and things like that. It was, I wanted to do something special around National Day of Truth and Reconciliation because last year we did, um, you know, just kind of going around at our block party. We recorded people saying what reconciliation meant mm -hmm. to them. So for this one, you know, I kind of wanted, was leaning towards, you know, a leader of one of the communities like uh, Chief McCaughey or someone to kind of talk about, you know, how the last three years of this day has meant to them and, and to have that recognition. With you on the podcast today, I thought it would be the best thing to talk to you being non-Indigenous and having to come in, you know, two years ago into this position that, you know, we've talked about was... Um, you know, you had, I don't want to say overwhelming, but there was a lot you had to do. Mm -hmm. You're basically at the, the ground floor mm -hmm. and you had to do a lot of work. And a part of that is you're facilitating something that's important to the community that you've talked about, mm -hmm. to First Nations communities, to Fort St. John, to the Peace Region. You, and so that's a lot of pressure on yourself. On top of that, you have to build the trust of these communities and meet with them. So what I wanted to talk to you about, you know, being non-Indigenous and, and having this role on something that's so important within the First Nations communities, how 
how's that process been over the past two summers of you, you know, really getting in there and building that trust with the communities and talking with elders? Is it just a process of, you know, you're not just doing it because of work, you're actually going to these events on your spare time and actually having these conversations? Like, how has it been for you over these past two years, kind of reflecting back on it, you know, building re these relationships, something that, you know, was, um, I believe we talked more something kind of new to you. Mm -hmm. How how has your life changed over the past few years with this position and, you know, really taking a focus on building these relationships and trust with First Nation communities and, you know, the community as a whole, the region as a whole, because this is such an important site, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I started here two years ago and, and during my very initial interview process, I said I'm from the region. I was born and raised in Dawson Creek. Um, I didn't know about the cave until I went off to university and um, was really intrigued that something that was so important existed in what I considered my backyard and I wasn't familiar with it. Um, I was an infant to the culture. I was completely new to the culture. And I think, um, you know, coming in um, with that attitude of I know nothing and I, you know, have an opportunity to learn something um, – I think really helped build those relationships and just being honest with myself about what my limitations were. And, you know, I came in and I said, I, I know how to write grants. I know how to, you know, build funding relationships. I know how to file an annual return. I need, I know how to do the, the technical things that are required of an executive director in a cultural heritage nonprofit, but I don't know the culture. And if, if you, my board, can assist me in that, if you can help me build those relationships, then I think we can, you know, jointly have success. And what I have found time and time again is that it is my board of directors, it is the staff, the administrative staff, the community members, the credit goes all to them for helping me to make those introductions, to facilitate those discussions. You know, when I come in and obviously people don't know me and they're still so welcoming. You know, every event that I've been to, I've, I've felt so welcomed and, and so cherished as somebody that's, um, you know, on this journey with them. Um, my very first visit to the cave was on my first day working for Saqua, and I walked the trail with our board president, Gary Oker, and he said, you know, we had talked at a great length about me being a non-Indigenous person in this role, and he said, we are walking this path together, and what's important is not what's behind us or what, you know, our personal histories are or the color of our skin. It's that we are, you know, looking down the path, and in this case, we're physically walking down the path, but of course, you know, metaphorically, we we have, you know, the goal ahead of us. We have that destination in front of us, and it's about walking that path every day and some days it's really easy some days you get to you know go to an event and everything's fantastic and you know you get to sit down with elders and and talk about the work that you're doing and and hear some of their fantastic stories and some days it's not some days you know you've got funding deadlines and you've got stuff that's really stressful or you you know you make a misstep um in you know saying the wrong thing or you know and it's about whether or not you're willing to still keep putting in that work. And I think something for myself that I've always um, striven, driven for is, is having, having the opportunity to continue to improve myself. And I think that um, the last two, two years, two and a half years have been an opportunity for me to reflect on the relationship that I have with the peace region um, the relationship that I have with the indigenous communities, the relationship that, you know, exists between me and I'll say the land more generally, and just continuing to put in that work. And when I talk to people, I quite often get, you know, asked about some of the, the racism that we encounter as an organization, um, some of the challenges we have around either misinformation or um, more often lack of education. You know, people don't come in graffiti on the cave because it's a national historic site. They do it because they don't know that it's an important site. And they say, you know, like, 
what do you say to the people that, you know, don't think that this site should be getting all the funding that it's getting or don't don't think that it deserves this recognition or, you know, any of those things. And what I say to them is, you know, 10 years ago, I might have been in those same shoes. I, I have grown, I think, a lot as a person to be at the stage where I am now. And, and certainly 10 years ago, I don't think I would have been deserving of this job, if I'm being honest with myself. Um, and that's not to, you know, pat myself on the back and say that I'm a fantastic person. Now I, I, I still think, you know, we've all got work to do mm-hmm. on ourselves. And for me, um, getting to build those relationships is such an incredible opportunity. And I love being able to, you know, sit down with, with an elder and hear their story or, or get the opportunity to, um, to, to, process a moose hide for example or to connect with some of these community members and it's really um particularly at the very start of my relationship building that having that um those introductions from my board of directors uh gary oker mm-hmm. laura webb and and the late diane bigfoot having those um real advocates in the community because this was their vision you know i i did very much start you know in terms of infrastructure at at the ground floor but there was 20 or 30 years of of, you know emotional Mm -hmm. labor that had gone into this site before i came on scene and so in that way it was it's kind of lucky to just be the one that just has to, you know, build an outhouse or, you know, write the grant because the, the real emotional labor and the cultural labor labor has already happened at that point. When you first started, did you realize how much work would have to go into the relationship building? And because even you're saying, you know, the board members, um, they kind of gave you, I guess, a couple steps forward in those relationships, but then you kind of have to do the work from there with their reputation kind of on your back. And, you know, I would do want to say too, and comment on some of the things you've been saying, you know, obviously the community and the board members and the community, uh, the first nations communities have helped you out, but I think the work goes to you. you. We talk about two summers in, you know, you didn't have to stay for two summers. You didn't have to keep doing it. You know, but seriously, yeah. right? Like, you know, with with everything you have going on, you didn't have to. And you still put in the work and maybe, you know, even in some cases extra, you know, building those relationships is still, you know, you're not calling it work, but it's still a part of the process and helping make Saqua, you know, as big as it should be here in the community and province and Canada as a whole. How do you balance the actual physical work that has to go into the site and that relationship building. Like I'm I'm assuming maybe you've finally got to the point where you have that balance or you're still working on it. I'm absolutely still working on it. And, um, again, thank you for, for saying that it, (laughs) you know, it is something that I've, I've tried to really focus on. And like you said, it's, it's not work per se, but it does relate to the work. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I started here, I started on a two year contract and both myself and the board said, you know, we'll see where, where we are after two years. And, when we got the opportunity to discuss um, kind of what my contract would look after those two years, I said, I, you know, I have learned so much, but there's still so mm-hmm. much more left for me to learn and, and opportunity for me to grow. And I still really want to be a part of this. And thankfully they felt the same way. Um, so, You know, they they did give me, you know, that leg up. But you're right. There is a balancing act. And, you know, when we talked about, um, you know, all of all of the work that's been done, but also the work that needs to be done. One of the the pieces of feedback that I asked for is exactly that. How how do I balance both getting, you know, getting the work done Mm -hmm. and also making time for those relationships? Because I don't want to feel that I'm having to schedule relationship Mm -hmm. building that doesn't feel genuine to me that doesn't feel authentic um that said um you know there are opportunities in our community um things like truth and reconciliation day but also um, i got to attend west moberly westmo days Mm -hmm. uh, for the first time this year and so 
um, I am able to kind of schedule those opportunities into my calendar and make sure that I'm making myself available. And this was um, an interesting summer for me in that it, it was kind of the first time that I felt that I was able to achieve the balance of both you know, getting the work done, there was a lot of work to be done, but also being able to, to stop and pause and to attend those community events and um, enjoy myself at those events, not feel, you know, this is coming from a, a non-Indigenous perspective, you know, when I go to an event, you know, you kind of have in the back of your mind, like, what are my objectives for this event? What are my, you know, what? Mm. And, and again, speaking in the terms of the funders, what are the deliverables? What are, you know, and that's not what relationship building mm. is about. Relationship building is about taking the time to slow down, to genuinely get to know people. Um, those those relationships need to happen organically, and they don't happen, you know, when somebody comes in, spends a year in the community, and then leaves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I honestly don't know if, if two years ago, if yeah, I, I certainly didn't know what the plan was after those initial two years was, you know, am I going to feel that I, you know, I'm ready to move on to mm -hmm. something else? Am I going to feel that, you know, it's, it's too hard? Is it too, you know, am I going to, I, you know, I want to strike that, that beautiful balance that we all do of being challenged in my job and feeling that I have something new to work towards, but that it's not so hard that I get entirely burnt out. Um, and, you know, this has been uh, such an incredible learning opportunity. And really, I feel that those relationships are the best thing I've got out of this job is getting to meet those people that I otherwise probably wouldn't have crossed paths with and getting to learn from them. I think each and every single community member that I've come across has been incredibly welcoming and, and I love to learn. And so many of them want to share what they have. And so that's been something that's really special for me and uh something i i am still working on finding mm -hmm. that 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 balance and, and i call it a work-life balance i know that's a cliche statement mm -hmm. but you know that um building the relationships while also getting things done and what we actually decided as as a board and as with myself was that you know for for next year and moving forward we we can be a little bit more deliberate with the, the particularly the physical infrastructure work that we do in order to make sure that I still have time in my schedule to to not neglect those relationships understanding that that is equally as important as building physical infrastructure and you know all the work that we've talked about has been physical infrastructure but Sequa has you know we've done place name research with our communities we've done some archival research on the history of Sequa we did some incredible plant work with the Twin Sisters Native Plant Nursery and all of those things things are are things that you don't necessarily see right away the beautiful thing about building physical infrastructure is that you see the results mm -hmm. you, you get to come out and go wow there's a beautiful giant dome here um you don't get to see relationships mm -hmm. in the same way and so you really have to still work at it even if you don't necessarily see the results in the same way that you see a 42 foot archaeology dome or a 60 person amphitheater you know you, you and i have had a similar i would say parallel path obviously different jobs but in terms of like relationship with um you know in, in indigenous communities myself it's been more of like a a identity um my cultural identity is what i've been learning about since i'm metis and um you know part of getting me into that process was the podcast and my former co-host jenna who we kind of went on that journey together and that was in november of mm -hmm. 2021 which was that was around when you started, right? That I don't was, think it uh, was. That was that about month. six months after I started. It was six yeah. months after, yeah. So you know, like it's you know, kind of in the same time frame. And then over the past couple of years, it's like I've learned so much. I've met so many great people. I've talked to so many great people. Had so many stories that I've just had the pleasure of of listening to. But I'm still in the beginner stage of you know building relationships on top of learning about my cultural identity and then on my work side you know like um as the news director at energetic city sometimes like you're saying you get lost in like i know i can write <laughs> you know i know i can edit i know i have that expertise but 
being in that news director role, that also comes with the relationship building. And that comes with, you know, talking with people in the community, especially with the, I would say, the overall um, thought process on media nowadays, mm -hmm. right? Like, and with the Facebook ban and everything going on, you know, it's very important for us, especially in a, a small community, to have those relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not to skew the writing at all, but that's to get every side of the story and talk to everyone in the community. So it's just funny how it's like, we've kind of had, you know, obviously very different jobs, but that parallel with the indigenous mm -hmm. communities and over the past couple of years. But the other difference is too, is you grew up here in the region, whereas mm -hmm. I just got here a couple of years ago. And it's, it's just, it's so cool you know, and I, I swear I bring this up in every podcast, bring up my time here and, and how that growth that I've had because it's, um, you know, Fort St. John, no, ever, no matter what happens in the future, if I leave, if I move where, wherever, it's still going to be in my heart. And Absolutely. these little experiences like Saqua, which is just, it's yeah. really cool. Well, really, and really, I really think cool. the other the other parallel between our jobs is the responsibility mm. that we have um, that we are both, you know, in a, in a different context, but we both are in a position where people listen to us. Mm -hmm. And I certainly feel, um, as executive director at CEQA, that I have a responsibility to elevate the voices of the community. I am in both, you know, a, a job position, but also a, a socioeconomic yeah, position. Yeah where people listen to what I say. And, mm -hmm. and just yesterday I was in a, a meeting um, with uh, some provincial government representatives. And when I spoke as executive director of this organization, I have, like you say, the responsibility of the community mm -hmm. behind me on my back. And, you know, if, if I have one hope for myself in this role is that I am able to support the, the capacity for the communities to continue this work after I'm gone and, and hopefully even, you know, pass this, this position on to somebody who's from the community who maybe just wasn't given the same opportunities. Mm. If you and I can create those opportunities to speak up um, and, and elevate those voices and not for myself, not speak on behalf of a community that I don't belong to, mm -hmm. but to give them an opportunity to elevate their own voices. That's a responsibility that I take quite seriously mm -hmm. and that I, um, I'm thankful that I've been given the opportunity to, to do so. As we wind down, my last question for you, you, everything goes as planned. You guys open up in the spring what are some other things that you have planned in the future for Saqua? You talked about having the full circle on the trail, some more signs. Is there anything else that we haven't mentioned on the podcast that you would like to see here in the future? And that could be, you know, in a year, a couple of years, mm -hmm. five, ten, you know what I mean? You you can go really Gary Oker and we can talk about this, <laughs> how it's going to be this huge... The multi-generational <laughs> yeah, yeah, plan, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I know that uh, one of the things that we've just, you know, briefly touched on is is the building. And, and eventually the goal is to have a full in museum and interpretive center inside. Um, the building feasibility study is going to help us to plan for what exactly that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly again and again, we've heard from our community members that having um, an interpretive center where they can share and where people can come and learn is very important. Next summer, we're looking forward to having UNBC back for the Archaeology Field School again, um, and there will be opportunities for public outreach as part of that. Um, I'm really excited to have the school kids back again in the spring. Um, it's so great to see them come out, and um, Gary does a, a great impression of this that I, I won't try to replicate, but you know, when the, the young kids come out and they walk down to the cave and they hear about its significance and, and all of the culture and the history associated with it and then they see the graffiti and they just say I don't understand why people do that I don't why would they wreck this important place and um, that's exciting because that's that's the next generation that's the community leaders of tomorrow that are coming out and that are going to to have that so there's 
there's certainly a lot of um, physical infrastructure to do. Um, what I'm hoping that we'll be able to spend a little bit more time focusing on moving forward is documenting more of the culture. Um, once we have our repository status um, from the BC Archaeology branch, we're going to be starting to focus on repatriating artifacts um, back to Saqua and having um, the material that was excavated here back in the 80s and 90s returned to this place. Um, those are all really important next steps for us and, and all things that we'll, be, that we'll be working on and focusing on once we have the basic physical infrastructure in place. And I'm so excited to have the community come out you know, know. and have people <laughs> I've be able to like be twice on this side. And you I, have, it's I exciting. Am. It's so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I know that so many people are so excited to come and see the site and I'm excited for them to come and see the site. We've put in an incredible mm. amount of work and yes. I'm looking forward to, to everyone being able to experience it together. Well, that is a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I love chatting with you. Uh, I don't even need to say that. You should know that by now. Um, outside of the podcast, she likes to randomly film me sometimes and <laughs> talk, talk about what's going on. It's nice for the updates. Yeah. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. And that's part of the relationship building. Yeah. Alyssa was one of the first relationships I built here in the community. And look at us now, a couple years later. Oslo, awesome. thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Alyssa Curry. Uh, she's an awesome human being and she's putting in a lot of work at the Saqua site. If you have any guest ideas for me, if you're like, hmm, I would really like to hear this person on Before the Peace chatting with Trey. Well, reach out to me, before the peace at energeticcity.ca or before the peace at musafm.ca through email. You can also reach out to me at before the peace on Instagram and before the peace underscore on Twitter. 